Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, it's really wonderful to see everyone here for this EA Global. Um, it feels like quite an understatement to say that much has happened since the last time I was on a similar stage about seven months ago at last year's uh, EA Global SF. So I'm really glad that Toby Ward, our uh, opening keynote speaker, will touch on some of the events of the past year, potential lessons and paths forward. So Toby is a philosopher at Oxford University. His work focuses on the big picture questions of humanity. What are the most important issues of our time and how can we best address them? Toby's earlier work explored the ethics of global health and global poverty. This led him to found Giving What We Can in 2009, uh, whose members have pledged over $3 billion to the most effective charities at helping to improve the world. He also co-founded the wider effective altruism movement, encouraging thousands of people to use evidence and reason uh, to help others as much as possible. Toby's current research is on avoiding the threat of human extinction and safeguarding a positive future for humanity, which he considers to be among the most pressing and neglected issues we face. So please join me in welcoming Toby. Hi, uh, it's uh, only been nine months um, since I was last here in the Bay for an EAG. Uh, has anything happened since then? Uh, uh, let's, let's talk a bit about the, the last year. So the spring and summer of uh, 2022 uh, were a time of rapid change. A second major donor had appeared, roughly doubling the amount of committed money. And th there was a plan to donate this money more rapidly than before and to use more of it uh, directly on projects run by people in the EA community. Together, this meant that much more funding for projects uh, led by EAs or about effective altruism. <clears throat> it felt like a time of massive acceleration with EA rapidly changing and growing in an attempt to find enough ways to use this money productively and to avoid it going to waste. And this caused a bunch of growing pains and distortions in the community. When there was very little money in effective altruism, you always knew that the person next to you couldn't have been in it for the money. Uh, so they must have been in it because they were passionate about uh, what they were doing for the world. But that became harder uh, to tell, uh, which also made trust harder. And the most famous person in crypto uh, suddenly became the most famous person in EA. Uh, so someone whose views and actions were quite radical and unrepresentative of EA as a whole uh, became the most public face of EA. Uh, and that distorted public perceptions and even our self-perception of what it meant to be an EA. Uh, it also meant that EA had become much more closely connected to an industry uh, that was widely perceived as sketchy, uh, one that involved a, a product of disputed social value uh, and a lot of sharks. One thing that especially concerned me uh, was the great deal of money also that was going into politics. Uh, we'd tried very hard over the previous 10 years uh, to avoid EA being seen as a left issue or a right issue, uh, immediately alienating half the population. But a single large donor had the potential to change that unilaterally. And EA had become extremely visible. People who'd never heard of it all of a sudden couldn't get away from it, uh, prompting a great deal of public uh, criticism, uh, much of which, in, in my view, was, was ill-informed. Uh, and from my perspective at the time, it was hard to tell whether or not the benefits of additional funding for good causes uh, outweighed these costs. Both were large, and they were very hard to compare. Even the people who thought it was worth the costs uh, shared those feelings. Uh, the feeling of visceral acceleration, uh, like a white-knuckled fairground ride, uh, pushing us up to vertiginous heights faster than we were comfortable with. And that was just the, the ascent. Uh, uh, so like, like many of us uh, here, uh, I was paying attention to the problems involved in the rise and was blindsided by the fall. 
uh, as facts started to become more clear, we saw that the companies producing this newfound income had been very poorly governed, uh, allowing behavior that appears to me to have been both immoral and illegal. Uh, in particular, it seems that when the trading arm uh, had founded, uh, customers' own deposits were being raided to pay for an increasingly desperate series of events uh, to save the company. Even if that strategy had worked uh, and the money was restored to the customers afterwards, I still think it would have been illegal and immoral. Uh, but it didn't work. Uh, and so it also caused a truly vast amount of harm, most directly and importantly uh, to the customers, but also to a host of other people, uh, including the members of the EA community, uh, and thus all the people and animals that we were using our lives to try to help. I'm sure most of you have thought a lot about this over the last few months. And I've come to think of my own attempts to process this as going through four different phases. First, there's the understanding what happened. Uh, what were the facts on the ground? Were there crimes committed? How much money have customers actually lost? And a lot of this is uh, still unknown. Second, uh, there's working out the role that EA played in all of this and the effect that it had on EA. Is EA to blame? Is EA a victim? Uh, both? How should we think about it when a few members of a very large and informal group do something wrong? Uh, when this is against the wishes of almost all of the others who are in the community? who are earnestly and conscientiously working to help those who are less fortunate. Yet we can't just dismiss this as an exceptionally rare and atypical action. Uh, it's an important insight of effective altruism that the total value of something can be driven by a few outliers. We're happy to claim those atypical cases when they do great amounts of good, uh, but we've seen that harms can be driven by outliers too. Third, uh, there's working out how best to move forward. Uh, this is clearly an opportunity uh, to learn how to avoid things like this ever happening again. Which lessons should we be learning? Uh, it's a time for thinking about new ideas for improving EA uh, and revisiting some old ideas uh, that we may have neglected. And finally, uh, there's getting back to projects for helping make the world a better place. Uh, this is what EA is fundamentally all about, uh, and it's what inspires us. It's what we ultimately need to return to, uh, and what many of us need to keep on doing now, uh, even while others uh, help work out what lessons we should be learning. And different people here will be at different stages of, uh, of this processing, uh, and that's fine. Uh, this morning, I want to explore some ideas, particularly related to the third step, uh, working out how best to move forward. Let me begin uh, by taking you back in time uh, 20 years uh, to the beginnings of effective altruism. In 2003, uh, I arrived uh, in Oxford from Australia, uh, fresh-faced and excited to get to study philosophy at a university uh, that was older than the Aztec Empire. Uh, over the next uh, six years, I completed a uh, masters and doctorate specializing in ethics. And one of the things that I studied was a moral theory called utilitarianism. At its heart, utilitarianism consists of two different claims about the nature of ethics. First, uh, that the only thing that matters, morally speaking, uh, is how good the outcome is. This is a claim about the structure of ethics. It says that ethics is just about outcomes or consequences. On its own, we call this claim consequentialism. And utilitarianism combines it with a second claim about the content of ethics, uh, that the value of an outcome is uh, the total well-being of all individuals. Now, this was a rather radical moral theory. Uh, and that's easy to forget, uh, but one of the most radical ideas of all uh, was that all beings mattered equally. Uh, women as well as men, people of all countries, religions and races, uh, and animals. 
It was an attempt uh, to free moral thinking uh, from dogma and superstition by requiring that morality be grounded in actual benefits uh, for individuals. And it had uh, practical reforming power. So it wasn't just a new way of explaining uh, what we already believed, uh, but it could be used to find out what we were getting wrong and to try to fix it. Uh, in doing so, it was ahead of the curve on many different issues. Uh, utilitarians spoke out in favor of all of the different things that you see here uh, long before they were socially accepted. Uh, but for all that, it was, a, it was and remains a controversial theory. Uh, it has no limits on what actions can be taken uh, if they promote the most good, and no limit on what morality can demand of you as an individual. It offers no role for the intentions behind an act to matter, uh, and makes no distinction between not helping people or actively harming them. Uh, moreover, it allows no role for ultimate values other than happiness and suffering. And ultimately, I, I don't endorse it. Um, the best versions are, are more sophisticated than the critics recognize and better than most people think. But there are still cases where I think it reaches the wrong conclusion. Uh, and it's very brittle. Uh, imperfect attempts to follow it uh, can lead to very bad outcomes. But there are also key parts of utilitarianism that are not controversial. Uh, it's not controversial that outcomes really matter. Uh, as the famous opponent of utilitarianism, John Rawls, uh, put it, all ethical doctrines worth our attention take consequences into account in judging rightness. One which did not would simply be irrational, crazy. And it's not controversial uh, that a key part of what those consequences are is the effects on people's well-being. As I studied utilitarianism, I saw some key things that became clear through that lens, uh, but which weren't often discussed. One was the moral importance of producing positive outcomes. So most ethical thought focuses on avoiding harm or mistreatment. It accepts that actively helping people is great, uh, but says very little about how to do it, uh, or that it could be a truly important part of your life. And another was caring about how much good we do. Uh, the idea that giving a benefit to 10 people is 10 times more important than giving the same benefit to one person. I saw that these two principles had surprising and neglected implications, especially when combined with empirical facts about cost effectiveness in global health. So they showed that the, the fact that each person living in a rich country could save about 100 lives if they really wanted to, and yet typically they don't. So that's a, a key part of our moral predicament, uh, which was being neglected uh, in moral thought. And they, they showed that when people or, or nations uh, donate to help others, it really matters where they give. It's the difference between whether they end up filling, fulfilling 1% of their potential uh, or 100%. It's almost everything. So these principles were not especially controversial, um, but they were almost completely neglected by uh, moral thinkers, even those focusing on global health or global poverty. And I wondered, uh, could I build a broad tent uh, around these robustly good ideas uh, that the utilitarians had found? I could leave behind the controversial claims of utilitarianism uh, that only effects on well-being mattered uh, and that these should just be added together in a simple way uh, and that well-being only took the form of uh, happiness and suffering. And instead, I could allow people to combine the ideas about the importance of doing good at scale uh, with almost any other approach to moral thinking that they may have started with. It was a place where one could draw surprisingly strong conclusions uh, on practical matters uh, from surprisingly weak assumptions. Because of the focus on the positive parts of moral life, I started calling this approach uh, pra uh, positive ethics uh, in 2010. Uh, and it was one of the main ingredients of what by 2012 we'd come to call effective altruism. 
unlike utilitarianism, effective altruism is not a moral theory. Uh, it's only a partial guide. It doesn't say that's all there is to value or to ethics. And it's compatible with a diversity of different approaches to ethics. Uh, you could combine it with side constraints, like th things that absolutely govern what actions we're allowed to take, with options, uh, with the distinction between acts and omissions, egalitarianism, allowing the intentions behind an act uh, to matter, and so on. Uh, indeed, it, it's compatible with uh, almost anything, uh, so long as we can still agree that saving a life is a big deal and saving 10 lives is a 10 times bigger deal. But if a way of helping a lot of people or animals conflicted uh, with these other parts of ethics, you would want to stop and think seriously about what to do. Are there alternatives that would get most of the value uh, without, while avoiding these other problems? Uh, and how should one make the right trade-off? Effective altruism doesn't tell you, uh, but I'd leave that up to the individuals. It doesn't have that much to say about how to resolve such conflicts. And I think that that is OK. Uh, it's like similar guides to action, such as environmentalism or feminism. Uh, it is, none of those are trying to be a complete theory of everything that's important. Uh, all three uh, point to something that's important and which others are neglecting, but they don't attempt to define how important that is compared to all other facets of moral life uh, so that one could resolve all of those conflicts. Instead, it's taken for granted that people from many different moral outlooks can join in the projects of environmentalism or feminism or effective altruism. To the extent to that EA has been prescriptive about such things, it's generally to endorse widely held prohibitions on action. So for example, in the precipice I wrote, uh, don't act without integrity. When something immensely important is at stake and others are dragging their feet, people feel licensed to do whatever it takes to succeed. We must never give in to such temptation. A single person acting without integrity uh, could stain the whole cause and damage everything we hope to achieve. Uh, others have made similar statements. Uh, I thought they were really quite explicit and clear, uh, but I certainly <laughs> wish we'd made them even more clear. Okay. I think EA may still have more to learn uh, from the centuries of philosophical thought on how to produce good outcomes. So a common definition of utilitarianism, different to the one I gave earlier, is that an act is right if and only if it maximizes their total well-being. Um, but there are two key problems with this way of defining it that I want to talk about. One is the focus on maximizing, uh, and the other is the, the sole restriction to acts as, as a focus. So first on maximizing. Here's a, here's a simplified case to help explain why maximization isn't quite the right idea, even in theory. Uh, so you have three options, to save one life, to save 99 lives, or to save 100 lives. I think the big difference is between A and the others. Of these options, A is mediocre, um, while the other two are great. But maximization says the big difference is between C and the others. C is maximal uh, and therefore right, and the others are both wrong. I don't think that's a good representation of what's going on here, morally speaking. Uh, sure, if you can get the maximum, great, uh, that's even better. Uh, but it's just not that important compared to getting most of the way there. Uh, the moral importance that's at stake in, in, in this case, and I think generally in life, uh, is really scalar, uh, not binary. And here's a case that helps to explain why maximization can be dangerous in, in practice. I, I thank uh, Finn Morehouse for this one. Uh, the vertical axis is supposed to represent how good the outcome will be, okay? While the horizontal axis here uh, represents how much optimization pressure is being brought to bear on something. So first let's consider what happens if uh, goodness, if we're thinking about goodness in terms of total happiness, and we're optimizing for total happiness. So a kind of utilitarian approach. So we might think that as we increase optimization pressure, uh, the situation gets better, but perhaps with diminishing returns. 
But what happens if you're still optimizing for total happiness, uh, but we're considering things from a different value system, uh, where happiness matters, but other things do too? Well, in that case, it, uh, it starts off improving, but as you get close to the full optimization, lots of other things are lost in order to eke out the last bit of happiness. The same would be true for many other value systems uh, that are different to utilitarianism. You could think of this as an argument for the fragility of maximization, uh, that if the thing you're maximizing is even slightly off, you can go very wrong in the extremes. Uh, as Holden Karnofsky put it in a rather prescient article, uh, maximization is perilous. Uh, this is a problem when you have any moral uncertainty at all. Uh, and even if you were, were dead certain uh, that utilitarianism was right, it would be a problem if you're trying to work together in a community with other people who also want to do good, uh, but have different conceptions of what that means. Um, it's more cooperative and more robust to not go all the way. Some of you will note that this is the, the same argument uh, for how things can go wrong if an AI were to truly maximize its reward function. So it's one we probably should have been more cognizant of already. As it happens, uh, some of the earliest formulations of utilitarianism, such as John Stuart Mill's, uh, were scalar rather than maximizing. And more recent utilitarians uh, seem to be converging on that being the, the best way to understand the theory. I think that effective altruism would do well to, to learn this lesson too, um, to have a focus on excellence rather than on perfection. A focus on the idea that it's, it's scale matters. Uh, so that getting twice as much benefit matters as much as all you've achieved so far. It really is worth seeing if you can reach that rather than settling for doing quite a lot of good. But not a fixation on the absolute maximum, on getting from 99% to 100%. So how should a utilitarian uh, go about deciding what to do? Uh, the most common and unreflective answer is to make all your decisions by constantly calculating which act has the best consequences. And most people who teach ethics at universities imply that this is part and parcel of what utilitarianism means. Uh, and then they may point out that this is self-defeating, uh, that due to a range of human imperfections and biases, it's likely to lead to a worse outcome, even by the utilitarian's own measure. But utilitarian philosophers don't recommend doing this. Um, indeed, for over 200 years, uh, they've explicitly called it out as a mistaken interpretation of the theory, and it's come to be known as naive utilitarianism. Instead, uh, they recommend making decisions in a way that will lead to good outcomes. Uh, whatever that method happens to be, if following common sense morality uh, would lead to the best outcomes, then by all means, do that. Uh, they see the uh, utilitarianism as an idealized criterion uh, that ultimately grounds what it means for one choice to be better than another, that it, uh, that it leads to a better outcome. But they distinguish this from a decision procedure uh, for day-to-day -day use. And the same is true for motives. Universal benevolence as a motive sounds very utilitarian, uh, but it's not always the best motive. Motives should be assessed in terms of the outcomes they lead to. Even Jeremy Bentham uh, explicitly said this. Uh, it's okay uh, to do things out of love for particular people or out of rage at injustice. Uh, often it's only by incorporating such motives that we can actually reach the best outcomes. So more recently, uh, some consequentialist philosophers, uh, so those philosophers who are committed that outcomes are the only things that matter, but who are neutral on what it is that makes an outcome uh, good. They've tried to systematize this thinking. Uh, they put forward an approach called global consequentialism uh, that says to assess every kind of focal point in terms of the quality of the outcomes that it leads to. So that's the same, you know, that's true for acts, decision procedures, motives, character traits, institutions, laws, uh, you name it. 
So as I, believe it or not, I've actually written a book about this. Um, uh, this was the topic of my dissertation at Oxford. Um, and while lots of dissertations are a pretty miserable read, uh, I went to a lot of effort to write it as a readable book, albeit an academic book in philosophy. Um, the idea was to publish it when I'd finished. Uh, but one month after I finished my thesis, I met uh, the student called uh, William McCaskill uh, and got distracted. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm still distracted. <laughs> and uh, I've managed to get a couple of other books out, but not this one. Uh, and I'm not sure when this distraction will end. Uh, so this morning, I put the full text uh, up on my website, uh, tobior.com. You can, you can find it. Um, <laughs> It's kind of the least I could do. I, I'd made it available if people emailed me about it, but uh, you know, uh, it's, that was a, an attempt. I was worried that, uh, that publishers wouldn't want to publish it if it was available for free. Uh, but it actually seems like we've moved on beyond that point uh, now. Uh, so, uh, so you know, we'll see what happens there. Uh, and and this, this dissertation, uh, it, it starts by observing that the three main traditions in Western philosophy each emphasize a different focal point. Uh, so consequentialism emphasizes acts. And from a certain perspective, it can seem like that covers everything in ethics. Every single time you are deciding what to do, you're assessing acts. And isn't ethics about deciding what to do? Uh, deontology emphasizes rules. And from a certain perspective, it can seem like that covers everything in ethics. Uh, ethics is a system of rules governing our, our action. And rules are closely related to what we called decision procedures a moment ago. And isn't ethics about how we should decide uh, what we should do, uh, i.e. what decision procedure it is that we should be following? Uh, virtue ethics emphasizes character. And from a certain perspective, it seems like this is what ethics is about. Uh, what makes someone a good person? How can I live a more virtuous life? But interestingly, uh, these uh, don't really have to be in disagreement with each other. It's almost like they're talking past one another. Uh, so I thought, could there be a way of unifying these three traditions? Uh, one thing I had to do uh, in the thesis was to provide a coherent theory of global consequentialism, one that ties up some of the loose ends in the earlier formulations and is logically sound. Uh, and then armed with that, I showed how it has the resources to capture many of the key intuitions about rules and character that make deontology and virtue ethics uh, compelling. To use an analogy of my supervisor, Derek Parfed, uh, it was like all three traditions had been climbing the same mountain, uh, but from different sides. So if naive utilitarianism leads to bad outcomes, what kind of decision procedure leads to good outcomes? Well, here's, here's my best guess. Uh, first, stay close to common sense on almost everything. It encodes the accumulated wisdom of thousands of years of civilization and hundreds of thousands of years of human life before that. Indeed, uh, even when the stated reasons for some rule are wrong, the rule itself can still be right, uh, preserved because it led to good outcomes over the years, even if we never found out why. Uh, don't trust common sense morality fully, but trust your deviations from it even less. Uh, it has survived thousands of years. Your clever idea might not survive even one. And explore various ways uh, common sense might be importantly wrong. So discuss them with your friends and colleagues. Uh, there have been major changes to common sense morality before, uh, and finding them is extremely valuable. Make one or two big bets. Uh, for example, my ones were uh, that giving to the most cost-effective charities is a key part of a moral life, uh, and that avoiding existential risk is a key problem of our time. But then keep testing those ideas. Uh, listen to what the critics say. New, most new moral ideas are wrong. And don't break common sense rules to fulfill these new ideas that you have. OK. What about character? Well, we can assess people's characters and individual character traits uh, by their tendency to produce good outcomes. Now, the philosopher Julia Driver uh, pioneered this approach and did great work on it. We can go through various character traits and think about whether they are conducive to good outcomes or not. 
uh, calling those ones that are conducive uh, virtues. And this will pick out character traits that have much in common with the classical conception of virtues, although it's not exactly the same thing. They're not knowable by pure reason uh, or introspection, uh, but they require experience. And I think that the importance of character is seriously neglected in EA circles. Perhaps one reason is that unlike many other areas, we don't have a comparative advantage in, when it comes to identifying virtues. This means that we should draw on the accumulated wisdom of others as our starting point. Here are some virtues to consider. Uh, there are virtues that help anyone achieve their aims, even if they were living on a desert island. These are less distinctively moral, but worth having. Uh, things like patience, determination, and prudence. And then there are virtues that, that, that relate to how we interact with others, uh, such as generosity, uh, compassion, humility, integrity, and honesty. I think we're actually pretty good at generosity and compassion, um, and sometimes good at humility too. I think integrity uh, deserves more focus uh, than we give it though. Uh, it's about consistently living up to your values and acting in a principled way in private, uh, living up to your professed values even when no one else is there to see. One of the features of integrity is that it allows others to trust your actions, just as honesty allows them to trust your words. Another interesting set of character traits uh, that are not always uh, identified as virtues are things like authenticity, earnestness, and sincerity. And I think these are character traits we could stand to see a lot more of in EA. An earnest disposition allows your motivation to be transparent to others, for everyone to be able to see the values that guide you. I think most of us who are drawn to effective altruism start with a lot of earnestness, uh, but then lose some over time. Uh, either to wanting to join the cool kids with their jaded cynicism, perhaps on Twitter, uh, <laughs> or, or thinking that it must be better to wear a poker face and choose your words carefully uh, than have a more kind of naive earnestness. But the thing about earnestness uh, is that it forces you to be honest and straightforward. If someone talks of something while brimming with earnest enthusiasm, it's transparent to all that they, that they care about it and that it's what drives them, uh, that it isn't some kind of ploy. I think this is especially important for EA. Uh, lots of people think that th we must have some kind of ulterior motives, but we often don't. Uh, if, if we're cynical or detached, people can't know either way. Uh, but earnestness and unabashed enthusiasm and excitement uh, is something that's hard to fake uh, and so it helps prove good intent. So armed with this focus on character, one obvious thing to try to do is to inculcate such virtues uh, in ourselves, uh, to put effort into developing and maintaining these different character traits. That is part of what I'm talking about, but it's not the whole story. We should also try to promote and reward good character in others. And we should avoid vouching for people with flawed characters um, or joining their projects. Even if you aren't sure that someone has a flawed character, if you have doubts, uh, be careful. And we should put more focus on character into our community standards. So is character, you might be wondering, is character really as important as these other focal points like selecting causes or interventions? For some choices, the best options are hundreds of times better than the typical ones, and thousands of times better than the poor ones. Am I saying the same thing is true with character? That instead of trying to find the most amazing charity, we would do just as well if EA was about having the most amazing character possible? Uh, no, uh, it's, it's important in a different way to that. I think a really simple model of the, the impact of character goes like this. The inherent quality of character doesn't vary anywhere near as much as, uh, as it does for charities. Imagine a factor that ranges from something like minus five to plus five, where one is a typical value, and that this factor acts as a kind of multiplier on, uh, on impact. The bigger the kind of impact someone is planning, the more important it is that they have good character. If they have an unusually good character, 
uh, they might be able to create substantially more impact. Uh, but if they have a particularly flawed character, then the whole thing could go into a reverse. Uh, this is especially true if their impact goes via an indirect route, uh, such as first accumulating money or power. Now, charities can also end up uh, having negative cost effectiveness, where the more money you donate, uh, the worse things get. Uh, but in our community, we spend so much time on evaluating them uh, that we can usually avoid the negative ones and are trying mainly to distinguish between the good and the great. But we don't have anything like the same focus on character, so we run a much greater risk of having people whose character is a negative multiplier on their impact. And the higher impact their work is, the more that that matters. So let's take a moment to return to what happened at FTX uh, last year. Uh, I don't think anyone fully understands what motivated Sam uh, or anyone else who was involved. I don't know how much it was greed, vanity, uh, pride, shame, uh, or genuinely trying to do good. But one thing that we do know is that he was already a committed utilitarian before he even heard about EA. And it increasingly seems that he was that most dangerous of things, a naive utilitarian, uh, making the kind of mistakes that philosophers, including leading utilitarians, had warned of for centuries. He had heard of the various sophistications needed to get the theory to work, uh, but seems to have dismissed them as being soft. Uh, if I'm right, then what he thought of as hardcore bullet-biting bravado uh, was really just dangerous naivety. And the sophistications that he thought were just a sop to conventional morality uh, were actually essential parts of the only consistent form of the theory that he said that he endorsed. So I hope it was uh, useful to see some of the history and how effective altruism was in part designed to capture some of the uncontroversially good ideas that utilitarians had found without the controversial commitments that doing good at scale really matters, but not that nothing else matters. It's been a hard year, uh, and we haven't fully sorted through its import. But I'm becoming more excited about some of the new ways of moving forward and improving the ideas and community of effective altruism. I've only really scratched the surface of it here. There's lots of good ideas uh, being discussed online. And I'm especially excited about getting back to the ultimate work of helping all of those who need us. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Toby. Um, and so with unabashed earnestness. I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks very much. Cheers.